of Silicon Valley Forum and just want to welcome everyone to the Startup and Venture Capital Club. And today we will be discussing something that every startup, it should be at the top of every startup's list. Let me put it that way. It, that is product market fit. And I want to thank everyone for joining us here today. And just a reminder that today's event is being recorded and everyone will remain muted throughout the duration of the program. However, we do encourage you to put any questions you may have for our speaker in the Q&A box that is located at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Before we get started, I would like to thank our partners at Hopkins and Carly, who are a Silicon Valley law firm. This program series would not be possible without their support, and we are very grateful for their partnership. Kiara Portner is a shareholder with Hopkins and Carly. And Kiara, um, I'm gonna turn this over to you because I would really love to know a little bit more about you and your firm and how you work with startups. Sure, thanks Denise. I'm Kiara Portner, welcome to the program. I am co-chair of Hopkins and Carly's IP department. We're really excited to partner with SV Forum and um, help with the programming over this year. I wanted to take just a quick moment to tell you a bit about our firm. We have offices in San Jose and Palo Alto, now everywhere in between and elsewhere with everyone working from home. We have over 70 attorneys now geared towards working with startups and investors and established middle market companies through all phases of their business cycle. We have expertise in financings, technology licensing, commercial contracts, privacy compliance, M&A, intellectual property, tax, branding and trademarks, real estate employment, and litigation if needed. So really all the services that a startup will need. Um, as Hopkins and Carly attorneys, we really focus on our clients' business needs and their operations and understanding the technology behind it to provide them with the most practical advice that we can. We're primarily comprised of former big law attorneys. So we streamline our staffing with more senior attorneys and partners that are billing at lower rates than, than many junior associates at, at big law in Silicon Valley. So we look forward to engaging with you. I will uh, include my contact info in the chat and enjoy the program. Thank you. Thanks so much, Kiara. Um, so I would also like to tell you, everyone, about my organization, excuse me, <coughs> which is Silicon Valley Forum. So we are a 38-year-old nonprofit organized over 50 of programs and events per year supporting and educating the global startup and technology ecosystem. I do encourage you to check out our website, of course, after this event is over, at siliconvalleyforum.com to find out more information about what we're up to and all the wonderful programs and events that we do organize for you. We are very excited for today's event, your virtual guide to product market fit. And our speaker today, <clears throat> excuse me, is the managing director of Microsoft for Startups, Shalu Garg, who has a long history of working with startups across many industries, both here in Silicon Valley, as well as, well as across the globe. And an interesting fact, she was also my co-host um, at our 2020 Women in Tech Festival pitch competition and really is an inspiration to so many of us, including myself. So Shalu, um, I'm gonna turn this over to you. One moment, um, Shalu is having um, trouble with her internet. So she's just gonna reboot her computer really quickly. Um, so if you guys can just hang tight for a few seconds. Okay. Thank you so much. Sounds good. I promise I won't be singing in the background or anything um, <laughs> um, as we wait for Shalu to come on. So in Silicon Valley, apparently we still have technical difficulties, right? 
think she's coming up now. Looks like she's here. Yay. Hey guys, I'm so sorry. This has been like <laughs> a tech crash course one on one. <laughs> Okay, we're glad you made it in. Shalu, <laughs> always making things interesting for us. I'm like, why does this happen to me? Denise, if you remember last year when I spoke, my camera gave up on me. I do remember that. What happens? <laughs> but um, anyway, so sorry. My apologies for being delayed. It wasn't intentional. You know, my laptop is not being my good friend today. So thank you very much. Really appreciate it. So will you be sharing your screen with us today, yes. Shalu? Okay, I'm, I'm just pulling this up. Hopefully there are no issues there. So just give me one second. So while I'm doing that, um, hey everyone, happy Thursday to you. Hope you're doing well, staying healthy wherever you are. Thank you very much for making the time to join this conversation today. I wanna to thank Denise, I wanna thank Amanda, Shira, everyone out there who, who just, you know, gave me an opportunity to be here. I got to tell you, uh, product market fit is one of my favorite topics. I just, I can go on and on about it because in my view, I, at least the space that I spend majority of my time in, which is mainly with entrepreneurs, it all comes down to, am I doing the right thing? Am I building the right solution? Am I gonna have a customer who's gonna buy whatever I'm building? And it doesn't necessarily have to be a technology solution. It can be a non-technology solution as well. So when Denise reached out to me, I'm like, yes, let's do this. So very excited to be here. Um, I do have a few slides here, but I prefer to use the slides more as a driver for the conversation. I love to engage. So I have my chat up here. If you have any questions, if you want me to pause, dig deeper into something, please, please feel free to uh, jump in, add color if you want, and we'll do this together. All right. So with that, Denise, I don't know if you have any opening comments or should I just uh, dive right into it? Just dive right into it. Okay, so, you know, I, I find this picture very interesting. You can see there are two bowls right there and there are oranges. A few of them are spilling from one bowl into another. And I literally view the product market fit conversation exactly like this. So if you were to ask me to paint a visual, although I'm not a good painter, but still I would say, is building a product really solving a problem or are you just doing it because you see a gap, you believe there's a gap that exists out there. And so, you know, the, the core theme that I will use across the next uh, few minutes is, is the orange grown to fit in the bowl, right? So are you building a solution that's really solving a problem or you're just trying to put pieces here and there and say, gosh, like this is the most amazing thing I'm doing in this entire world. So with that, um, I will just get into my, I don't know if Denise, you've introduced me, but I, I work with Microsoft, but up, uh, outside of that, I am associated with UN Women. I'm a Forbes contributor as well. Love writing about diversity and inclusion and all the good stuff that's happening in the social impact space. So with that, let's get into the top three questions that I usually ask entrepreneurs. So just to give you a little bit of background as to what my daily life looks like, I spend 90% of my day, other than my kids, but 90% of my day just meeting and talking to entrepreneurs. So for me, it is super critical like if you if you ever meet me in real life or you know if you have um, a Zoom call or whatever, and if you say, gosh, like, you know, I, I'm building this, I have this startup and this is my vision. I usually tend to get deeper into your personal story, which is, you know, why are you doing it? What, what is your main driver? And oftentimes it's very interesting where people say that, you know, I'm building, let's say a solution or I'm building an AI algorithm to figure out if there is even some sequencing around cancer, um, primarily because my mom had cancer, right? So there, there are just amazing mission related stories that I come across. But the big thing is, why are you even building the product? Why are you even doing what you're doing? And there are 
variety of spectrum of responses. I, I've often seen founders say, gosh, like I really believe in it. I, I really do. I think, you know, this is the best thing that can ever happen. But the big question is, is that enough? Like your belief, your conviction, your passion, your goal in life, is it really enough to drive the business for you? And when I say drive the business, I don't necessarily mean or insinuating that it's purely for a commercial startup. It can very well be for nonprofit startups as well. So is belief enough? That's the number one question. The other thing is who's gonna buy the product, right? So the next thing is, all right, so you're building something. Well, who's your consumer? Is it your neighbor? Is it you know a big large enterprise? Is it a ten year old girl? Is it a teenager? Like who is buying your product? And oftentimes, when especially in the early stage of companies like C pre seed, when you know an entrepreneur is still trying to figure out like do I go with beachhead strategy, which is really focused, or do I keep it really broad so that I can get whatever I can? The answer is often ambiguous. And again, this is across the spectrum, which is, you know, yes, I know, I know exactly who's going to buy my product or, you know what, my product is so generic that anybody can buy this product, which is awesome. I mean, I'm yet to come across a product that, that is valuable and applicable to everything. The other question that, that often, you know, we, we look for when we are evaluating a product market fit is how am I going to build a product, right? So, on the surface, if we look at the previous two facets, one is, well, why am I even doing it? Who am I doing it for? And then how am I gonna build the product? So it's very critical to focus on the team angle here. And you know, as you can see, my responses there is, gosh, of course, I'm gonna hire top talent. But is hiring top talent enough to sustain the company that you're building? Is hiring top talent enough, sufficient to contain the passion that you're building the solution with, right? So I, I just wanted to use this as an icebreaker and put it out there that oftentimes when we look at product market fit, it's not just about looking at what's the gaps that you're trying to fill in, but there's a much broader conversation that goes into it. Now, if you look at this slide, let's take a back step. And I'm sorry, I'm not able to see my chat here, but I'll get right to it. Is any anyone here who thinks that you know early stage? I know there are a mix of uh, audience here, but anyone out there who ever started a company saying everybody is my buyer? I still haven't figured out who my um, audience or who my buyer is going to be. But guess what? I'll still do it. Anyone out there? Okay, sorry, I'm not able to see the chat. So let me keep moving. So other than this, um, I'm gonna frame these questions again and then we'll draw some distinction between both, which is once again, why are you even building the product? The most responsible, and I use the word responsible with responsibility, the most responsible response out there is because there's a 25%, and this is just an example, X percent of total addressable market size that's sitting out there out of which only Y percent has been penetrated. That means it's enough for me to go out there and challenge the market that's out there, which is disrupting what's already out there. The other thing is who's going to buy the product. Now we're getting a bit more deep, deeper, which is maybe it's vertical oriented, maybe it's fintech, a specific genre of, of um, startup that may be out there, which is, um, you know, I really want to go for a mixture of fintech with AI or fintech with machine learning, so on and so forth, market segmentation, et cetera. And then last but not the least is how am I going to build the product? Guess what? The previous response was I'm going to hire top talent. Here it is, build a team that's passionate. That's going to help me be successful. So yeah, I'm gonna share a, a sort of a real life example with you that I had um, an experience with. So just outside of my daily work with, uh, with Microsoft, I do a lot of philanthropic work. I am, as I mentioned to you, engaged with UN Women. I 
do a lot of work in developing economies like Somalia, Syrian refugee camps, Uganda, so on and so forth. And I remember back in 2018, I, I had gone to Syrian refugee camp and that was purely because of my work with UN and I stayed there for 10 days. It was a very interesting experience. We need to have that conversation some other time, but I, I came, came out of, of that whole experience as, as, a, as a very transformed person. It taught me a lot. And during that journey, during and there were a mixture of women from across the world. And I remember the roommate who I was sharing the tent with um, in, in the refugee camp, um, I, you know, we just started talking and I, I asked her, I said, hey, Alyssa, like, what's your big dream? What do you want to do? And she told me that she wanted to build a company and she wanted to build a company where no girl ever had to beg to go to school. And for those of you, you know, who are familiar with me, I'm very, very passionate about ed tech space. I've done a lot of work in that space. And, you know, one thing led to another. And I spoke to her last year during COVID. Surprisingly, I got an email from her. And it was a very interesting conversation where she told me that she already started a company. She was, uh, you know, in very early stages of raising funds. She was looking for tips. She said, hey, how should I do it? And one of the questions I asked, I said, Alyssa, why are you even doing it? Like she came, she, you know, she looked to me as someone who's very well educated, extremely polished, like she was doing well. She's, she's working for one of the biggest firms in UK. And I was like, why are you even doing it? Right. And again, it was my curiosity there. And she said, I want to do it because there are a billion plus girls out there who are not allowed to go to school. And it doesn't make any sense to me, right? And so right there, I'm, I'm trying to fit her dialogue. And although I don't remember the conversation very, very much so, but I do remember there's certain things which she hit on where I personally felt, gosh, like this woman has made it. Just give her a year to three years and she's going to fly because she was crystal clear on the market she was going after. She knew that she wanted to penetrate at markets where technology was not dominant. So she was very clear on that vision. She was also clear that she's strictly going to address girls who are not allowed to go to school. So that myopically reduces your market size to a very specific gender and age, which is totally fine. You know, there, we can build solutions for boys who are not allowed to go to school, but she decided to choose girls, totally fine. And then she knew that her buyer or her consumer is going to be the local community where you know she didn't have any whatsoever say in going and fighting the local communities who were, who were not allowing the girls to go to school but she knew that they would be her buyers if she was able to convince them she would be a winner coming out of this and then finally this is the best part i asked her i said well how many people do you have on your team and you know what's your goal and she said i've and, and so she wasn't paying them, but what she said is she's built a team of girls, volunteer girls, volunteer girls who are strictly between the age of 13 and 18. Because she said she wanted to tap into the user mindset of how these girls actually think. And so the reason I share this, this story with you is to me personally, you know, as I said, I meet a lot of founders on a daily basis. It was very powerful because coming into the, the business that she was setting up, she knew the product that she was building and she also knew her market very well. And that's the power that a good thoughtful process holds. And, and of course, you know, the, the larger spectrum of, of the conversation here is, you know, how do you figure out that sweet spot that, that you want to dive into? So with that, I am, and this is me coming from experience here is three non-negotiable facets for product market fit. I honestly, I think there are a lot of brilliant ideas in this world and very few are executed well. And there is a reason for it, right? You need good wisdom around you. You need good experienced people. You need coaches and mentors. And I always say this, like uh, never feel shy to ask someone to be your coach. I have coaches who are in their early 20s. Like I've got millennials as my coaches. I go, I talk to them and I say, guys, like what's going on? Talk to me in your space, right? And I have coaches who are super experienced, who are, 
you know, very close to retirement and they have been CEOs all their life. And so it's very important to, to sort of bear that in mind as I'm going through this. So non-negotiable facets in my view, number one is you absolutely need to know what you're doing. This passion on passion is one thing, right? So let's say if coming back to that orange bowl example that I, that I had up front, if I'm passionate about, you know, eating oranges, let's say I love eating oranges and gosh, like I'm growing a tree in my backyard because I love it, right? It's purely because of me, my need, my passion. But what if the tree has so many oranges growing that it starts falling and it starts getting rot rotten out there? I'm actually not leveraging or capitalizing on something that I am building with me right now. And so it's super critical to have that crystal clear clarity on what my total addressable market size is. And with that comes the questions, what problem am I solving? What does the market really comprise of, right? Back to the question of uh, the example of Alyssa that I shared with you, where she was very myopic. She said, hey, I've seen this world, I've seen this space, I really want to build solutions that will help young girls go to school who are not allowed to go to school. So it's very critical. And I, I think it comes also with experience and bruises, right? And I use the word bruise because you fail quite a few times. Firstly, you're trying to figure out like, what am I doing? You're scrambling. And then you just go and build it. And sometimes you fail, God forbid you don't, but sometimes you do. And that's okay. That's where you learn the lesson from that maybe I should have done it some, some other way. The next is who's the buyer? I think it's very critical. And I see so many entrepreneurs struggling in this space. When I ask them, well, how are you going to monetize the product that you're building? And who is your buyer? They fumble. They don't know who their buyer is. And I think it's very clear. Spend time. And this is something I tell most of the entrepreneurs. Like, there's no rush. We, nobody's in a rat race here to go and launch a startup, unless, of course, if you have a personally driven reason. But take time to do your due diligence in understanding who your buyer is and then build the profile of your buyer um, and, and make sure you get deeper into the behavioral facets and the buying patterns of that buyer. Next is competitive landscape. I mean, needless to say, if you're out there as a founder, as an entrepreneur playing, you, you gotta know who your competition is, whether it's large incumbents, whether it's other startups, does not matter. Like you, you got to know who your competition is and you literally have to keep up to speed on that. Next is the value prop. Again, it sort of ties into competitive landscape. If let's say you have 10 other competitors, then what is the unique value proposition that you're bringing to the table? And that's very, very critical. And I have, I have often seen the, the, the new, I would say, um, the realm of startups that I'm seeing in the COVID world that are being born, as we call born in COVID space, it's just amazing how smart the entrepreneurs are. Like we are picking the game really well and we are thinking through digital transformation, especially in, in B2B products that, that, that I have seen where, you, where entrepreneurs are ahead of the game. That you know, in COVID, if we were challenged with X, Y, Z, I'm going to build a product that will not only help you resolve your problem, but also help you diversify in other industries. So lots and lots of great examples there. The other question I would say is, are you really disrupting? Or are you just iterating? And you know, this is a very interesting question that, that actually I was asked. Um, Prior to me joining Microsoft, I was at Oracle and I remember when I was leading the startup space there, I was building the startup practice for Oracle. I remember um, I was taking one of my startups to a Fortune 500 company <clears throat> in New York City. And I was flying with this founder uh, in good old times when you could fly United, which seems like a paradise now. But I remember flying from San Francisco to New York, which was you know over a six hour flight. And we were sitting and chatting, we were just sitting together and it was, you know, I kept asking him, I said, look, are you ready? Like, this is game time. Make sure you have your, your, you know, your game ready. We are meeting with the CIO. This is one short thing. And he was like, oh, no, you know, I've got this. Don't you worry. I'm going to land this smoothly. And I remember the first thing that the CIO asked her as soon as we sat down was, are you disrupting or are you iterating? 
And I remember looking at him and he was looking at me and we were like, sorry, can you please repeat your question? And it was very interesting because the question is, are you really truly innovating? Or are you just building on something that someone else has built? You're revising the feature functionality, you're packaging it up, you're putting it in a very nice Tiffany box and you're putting a nice pretty bow on it and shipping it out. And that is a question you need to ask yourself because the longevity of the solution and some of the best solutions or, or companies or startups that have taken exits or now going SPACs, you can easily see are disrupting the market. And it's okay to even iterate. There is no harm in it. I'm not saying that everyone needs to you know, build a tower of innovation, but be clear in your head, what are you doing? Are you really challenging the status quo? which is disruption, or are you building on something that's already built and, and you're just iterating on it and creating your own little space in, your, in the market? So it's super critical there. And then third is test market and feedback loop. Um, look, I, I'm a strong believer of design thinking principle. I've been using it forever, ever since I did my MBA and every single role that I've had, I apply the principles of design thinking. I still do it today. If you come even to my home office, I have post-its all around my table because that's, that's how I work. I think it's very important to be grounded in, in as you're building your company. And I, I have seen some of the best solutions fail because the founders or the team feels that, gosh, like this is the best thing and nobody can beat us. And guess what? Someone comes in your backyard, lands, take a, sm a smooth landing and takes your customers away. You don't even know. So it's very important to listen to your customers, your partners, friends, and competition, because someone somewhere is talking about what you're building and you need to build a loop, a feedback loop without any bias, without any judgments and be open to taking whatever comes your way saying like, tell me, how am I doing? You know, what else can I do differently? And take that to grain because it's, you never know where that feedback can take you. And I remember um, meeting an entrepreneur about three years ago who took some feedback very seriously from actually one of, you know, he was, he was at a VP level. And I remember like it was three levels down uh, and, and this gentleman was still, he was in a corporate role and he was thinking of quitting and building his own company. And he got feedback from someone really lower down or junior on his team, less experienced. And he took that feedback and he actually took it seriously, right? And, and acted on it when he built the company. So, you know, I, that's something that I believe in as well. Hopefully one day I'll become an entrepreneur myself. But that's something that, that I truly believe in is that feedback loop is very important. So with that, I know we have just a few minutes here. I see um, some questions coming in. Let me just quickly look at it. Um, all right, I'm, I'm just gonna read this before I move into my words of wisdom, which is totally a pep talk, but let's look at this. So Nicholas says from your experience, what is realistic time frame to achieve product market fit? So great question. I would say it can it can vary, right? I mean, sometimes you are you're such a strong believer of the gap that you have seen in the market that you're sleeping, drinking, you know, eating the solution that you have, and you you tend to get there faster. Sometimes it takes months, and sometimes I've seen years. Let's not forget Uber, how Uber came in. If you go back and read the story of Uber, which I now believe is being shared in all the management schools, Ivy Leagues, like Howard and Stanford and others, is it took two and a half years for the founders of Ubers to actually get a product market fit because nobody could relate to the fact that somebody, what, like somebody would come to my door and pick me up, really? And I don't even have to use cash? How can I sit in a car with a stranger? I, I don't feel safe. Right? But it took them two and a half years to convince the market that you can do it. And it is economical, it's safe, not always, but that model can be executable. So it really depends. But you know, my recommendation is spend as much time as you can upfront in doing that product market fit because that's really the building blocks of what, what you will be building as a company. 
All right, there's another question um, from Larry. Appreciate your perspective today. Thank you, Larry, for the kind words. Many of the key things that you highlight, humility to ask for coaching, are essential for successful company, but seem to go against the popular impression of the VCs. Look, gosh, who, Larry, I want to talk to you. <laughs> I get this so much. So do you think VCs are at risk of encouraging the opposite set of traits? You know, I so, so let me tell you this. I, I have some really good friends um, who, who are venture capitalists and I have sat in all kinds of evaluations. I have seen companies being rejected on reasons that I just scratch my head. I'm like, why, like, why did we do it? And, you know, two, three years down the line, you see those companies doing so well. Um, the, the common, I would say, perception of venture capitalists in Silicon Valley is all over the map, right? There are some that are super friendly. There are some that you never see, you never hear from. And there are some who are still emerging. So it is a Silicon Valley perception. And I think slowly it's also filtering into UK. I see that happening a lot in Dubai right now in UAE. That's one of the markets I track very closely because there's so much goodness there in terms of innovation. I, you know, it's, it's sort of a personal thing that I would say is humility should continue at a personal level. Even if I have someone arrogant sitting across me and you know shows that I'm not good enough or my solution is not good enough, I'll take that as a positive feedback. But it is it is a tough market, Larry. I, I completely agree. And and you just have to, you know, keep your head down and keep pushing. That's that's all I can say. Hopefully that was helpful. So with that, um, quickly, I know we have 20 minutes here. I want to make sure we give um, time for other QA as well. Uh, let's move on to, all right. So, you know, this is something that I usually share and I, th these are my personal beliefs, which actually go beyond product market fit. So they are not just relating to product market fit, but whenever I speak to entrepreneurs on topics like culture and not giving up, and staying persistent and being tenacious enough to challenge the status quo in times of ambiguity, right? There are a few things that I have learned and I have learned this from my mentors, my coaches. I've actually learned it from entrepreneurs as young as 16, 17 year olds. And I apply these principles in my daily life myself. And so I thought it would be good to wrap up this conversation and leave you with some goodies which is number one, you lead with passion and fire in the belly, right? It is your passion. It is your belly and it's your fire. And so it is very important as you're getting feedback on product market fit, or even let's say as simple as your hiring technique, someone may say, gosh, like what kind of people are you hiring? Are you, have you lost it? Like there's so much good talent there, but it is your belief. It is your conviction. So it is very important to lead with passion and fire in the belly as an entrepreneur, very important. And I always say this, there are a lot of founders who come to me and say, gosh, like, you know, someone said my solution is not good enough or I'm really passionate about this. And my response to them is, you know, this is your baby. Even if the baby is ugly, it doesn't matter. Just because someone else has said, hey, you know, your baby is ugly, it doesn't mean. I mean, to you, that's the most beautiful baby in the entire world. And so lead with passion and fire in the belly. I'm also going to share a quote that's near and dear to my heart. And it is the most powerful weapon on earth is a human soul on fire. It's by Field Marshal Fedrin Foch. She's got some amazing quotes there. And it is a human soul on fire because one of the things that I have learned from my personal experiences is that you absolutely need to be so obsessed with the end result that hard work becomes irrelevant, right? And that's where passion comes in. So that's number one. Number two is challenge the status quo, shake it up. Guess what? It's you're challenging the status quo. There will be 99 hands who will raise and raise their hands and say, this doesn't make any sense to me. You're wasting your time. You're wasting your money. But there'll be that one hand that will say, good job, keep going. And so it's very, very important to challenge the status quo as you're, as you're looking for that product market fit you have to challenge the status quo. You have to create a niche for yourself. Even if it's one door in 100 doors, 
that one door is yours and you need to create that niche for yourself. Another quote I'll share with you, it's by Ray A. Davis. Again, I, I have this whole book of quotes on, on everyone and he's one of my favorites where he says, status quo's are meant to be broken. And in fact, there's another quote he has. He says, status quo's are meant for folks who just don't have the wisdom and the guidance to, to challenge it. And that's what it is. So, so, you know, just challenge it, accept whatever, uh, whatever seems good to you, whatever seems right to you and go with that. And then third is, this is one of my favorites, which is believe in your people. And by people, I don't mean your team. I don't mean, you know, the, your investors, but your community, your family, your friends, your well-wishers, you know, I, 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 I'm on LinkedIn and Twitter, although I rarely get time to go there, but I, I get this amazing notes. Like a couple of weeks ago, I spoke at an event in UAE and I got so many messages saying, hey, you know, we relate to what you're saying and we want to be in your circle. And that got me thinking like, what is my circle? Is my circle Microsoft? Is my circle UN? And no, the answer is that's not my circle. It's everybody, right? Everybody that's around me and that come across, who I come across in my daily life. And so you have to believe in your people and you have to invest that time and effort and that trust in the people around you. And that, that could be your community. I'm gonna end on a high note here. Michael Jordan, one of my favorite athletes, um, I love this. And in fact, every year when I'm sending holiday goodies to my customers or my partners, this is one, you know, the notes that go out. I always, always say this, which is, you know, talent win games. Games are for, for folks who are really good in what they do. But if you wanna go for the big championships, you need teamwork, right? You need the right people as part of your team. You need people who can support you, who can ground you and not just rave about you and give you an ego boost when you're doing well. You need people who can tell you that, gosh, you suck and here's how you need to improve. And so with that, I'll pause here. I know, I hope I've not gone over time here and see if anyone has any questions, any comments, and I'm trying to, I see there are some Q and A's here. Denise, if you're okay with it, I will quickly, okay, those were the two that I've already answered. There are um, two questions uh, in the chat box. Um, okay, I'm sorry. I will just stop sharing so that I can actually get to this. All right. Uh, da -da -da. Uh, sorry, okay. Hi, Shalu. Do you think, um, and I'm sorry, this is from Nick. Do you think that a pure number driven why is enough to really build something sustainable? Meaning when things get tough in 25% TAM and 6% market penetrated enough to justify your blood and sweat? Or is it a combination, I believe, in it passionately and there is a market potential? Yeah, I think, I think that's a very good point. Um, once again, you know, and I, and I included that as an example purely just to set some perspective that just because, you know, you have oranges going and growing in your backyard doesn't mean that now you're going to create a market for it. It's, it's your understanding of your conviction that yes, you know, there is a market for it and data plays a big role. So I, I absolutely completely understand and, and agree with you that there has to be a market potential or absolutely create a new market for it. And, you know, that's, that's where the real entrepreneurship comes in. If, if you look at some of the most amazing solutions, like I gave you an example of Uber, nobody even thought that Uber would exist. Now you have the brothers and sisters of Uber all across the world, and they are, they are following similar business models. All right, um, I have another question from a &B staff. Do you have any suggestions for looking at a market for older adult senior citizens, specifically older women, 65 plus, started a nonprofit? Yeah, I mean, would love to chat with you. There are so many, um, in fact, I can connect you to some really good investors and people who are, who are deeply invested in this space. There's definitely a market and, you know, it'll, it'll depend on what solution you're offering to that market, right? Of course, there are a lot of, um, lot of compliance issues that come in, a lot of 
a lot of gated issues. But yeah, I, I absolutely, now you haven't mentioned your solution, but would love to chat with you and see if there's anything I can do to help you there. Um, sorry, let me just take this. Shalu, I coach a lot of entrepreneurs and they always ask me, when is the right time to stop trying to find a product market fit without success and pivot? Man, this is an amazing question. Um, oh, it's a tough one. You know, I would say don't give up, but honestly, I have seen entrepreneurs sell their homes come really low financially and they're still not ready to give it up. And I think this question was asked earlier, like in what time frame do you think? I would say give it a few months. I have actually seen a year to year to go and keep continue trying. But ultimately my two cents here is you need to surround yourself with people who will give you good guidance. And that would that should be a combination of definitely have investors. And by investors, I don't mean people who are looking to invest in your business. You can actually go to some really awesome investors and say, hey, I just need 30 minutes of your time. What do you think? Um, I think it's important to do that. It's important to stay connected with folks who are on the ground with startups like myself. There are many others and continue getting guidance. Um, it's very important and it's super important to stay in touch with reality. And, you know, sometimes it doesn't work out and um, sometimes you get exits. And some of the toughest stories that I've heard, some what actually more, some of the most successful stories that I've seen or heard about have tremendous amount of persistence and hard work that have gone in, not that others don't, but I just, just want to share that, um, you know, it's a story with everyone. I don't think there's any entrepreneurs come out saying, gosh, like I figured this out in a week and I'm out. I got an exit in three years. It, it takes time and persistence. And that's why, you know why? That's why it's called entrepreneurship. That's why it's called innovation. And that's why it's called disrupting the status quo. So, you know, hats off to you guys who are, who are definitely doing this. Sure, Michelle, thank you for such an awesome question. Um, Shalini, I got your email ID here. We'll definitely reach out. Um, okay, I have another question from Nicholas. Can you maybe give an example when iteration becomes disruptive innovation? Yeah, you know, um, it's interesting you asked that question. I So, so there is an AI solution that I was... I was looking at, and actually I was evaluating them. One of the investors who I work with had reached out to me from my perspective and said, hey, you know, what do you think? Do you want to just talk to this founder and figure out what's going on? We are looking to invest very early stage, but you know, would love to hear your perspective from a technology angle. And that's when I get involved because obviously I'm on the tech side and I can go deeper in the technology. But I remember this um, gentleman who was very, very enthusiastic, very passionate about the solution that he was building. I saw his emails come in, Shalu, like, you're gonna make my day, the day I talked to you. And I was like, gosh, like, bring it on. Let's have this conversation, right? And so I get on a call and we are talking about um, cancer research, right? And it's a very hot and volatile topic in healthcare industry. Everyone is looking for that cancer research solution, which is, you know, it pretty much, you you get to know that you're going to be a cancer patient in a year's time. I mean, imagine the disruption, how many lives will that solution save? And I remember speaking to him and I said, you know, Stanford is already doing this and that research study is already out there. What are you doing differently? And he said, all I'm doing is I'm building some algorithm, machine learning algorithms. And I'm like, but, but really, I mean, why do you need to start a business for that? You can just go and work with Stanford and I'm sure they'll hire you willingly. You've got the skills. Why are you building a solution? And he said, no, because I want to do it. It's, it's something that I truly believe in. And I told him at that time, I said, look, it's going to be very difficult convincing the health tech investors to invest in your business because it's writing on the wall. This is nothing new. But what he went on, so he took the feedback and 
what he went on to do was actually build, so if you're familiar with um, meters for diabetes, you know, you just do a prick and you get your number, either 92, 100, so on and so forth. So he's now working on a blood test solution, like if you can run it at home, which will show you some parameters that will have possibly cancer DNA sequencing. It is a long moonshot, very, very ambitious. But, you know, to your question, Nicholas, it's, it's almost like, you know, we are taking him from a point of failure to something brand new, which, which you know, even he didn't think. And I, and I heard, I haven't talked to him lately, but I've heard that he's also partnering with Stanford on that. So a lot, um, lot of possibilities. Once again, comes to, you know, who, who is your circle of influence? Who, who are the people around you? And um, who can actually drive you and take you to a good point? All right, any other questions? I see one new message. Can you? Oh, okay, I got that. All right, Denise. All right, well, thank you so much, Shalva. Do you, I just um, one question. Um, do you have any one last bit of advice for um, our audience today before we sign off? Yeah. Um, you know, I, I think I mentioned um, earlier on in, in, in my conversation here is um, no matter what stage of growth you're in, in terms of your company size or whatever, you have to be obsessed with it. And whether you're an entrepreneur or not, like I'm obsessed with my goals. And, you know, do not take the word obsessed. Like a lot of people say, gosh, like you, you've got problems in life. <laughs> Use the word obsessed. But it is, you need to be obsessed with the end goal so much that all the day and night and the work that you spend in, you're not complaining. It just becomes a slam dunk that, hey, hard work is a part of it and I got to do it if I need to reach my goal. So no matter what stage of company you're in, no matter what you're building, how far you are from your goals, um, become obsessed about it and then go chase it. Excellent, excellent. Well, thank you so much. We enjoyed thank having you. you here today, Shalo. Um, and we wanna thank our partners again at Hopkins and, and Carly for making this um, program possible. And also want to let everybody know that the next um, session in our Startup and Venture Capital Club series will happen on March 25th, and um, that session will focus on um, concept to commercialization, intellectual property, and the path to market. And it'll be also at 10 o'clock a.m. Um, Pacific Standard Time. So we hope you can um, join us then. And thank you so much for um, joining us today. And we hope to see you soon and have a great rest of the day. Thank you.